so then I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take the, the freedom to, to introduce uh, the, uh, our next speaker in, in this session, who is uh, Elisar Barbar. Um, Elisar actually grew up in Lebanon, but essentially she completed her education and did all her career essentially in the United States, uh, where she moved first into uh, Portland to do her PhD with uh, David Payton in chemistry. And then he went to Minnesota uh, with uh, uh, Claire Woodward uh, to uh, where she developed an interest in, in IDPs in, uh, in NMR. And after that, she essentially uh, joined Oregon State University, uh, where she started her, her, own, um, her own independent career as a researcher uh, um, working in, in, in biological relevant systems uh, such as uh, dynein uh, and other, other proteins, where she, I mean, producing the, the literature she has published in order to, to do this very short introduction. Uh, I, I found that uh, she, she has this, this kind of uh, compromise between biophysical techniques and uh, thermodynamics and uh, applied all these uh, with a very interesting uh, biological systems. So all I can say is that I'm really looking forward uh, to your presentation, Elisa. Thank you very much. Uh, you didn't ask me any questions about that. So you did, <laughs> you did quite a bit of research. Um, let me share my screen. And uh, good morning, and good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's uh, the uh, is my screen looking okay? Can I can I start? Yeah. Um, I'm. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Marcus, and and for the nice introduction. It's. Um, uh, the, the international flavor of this meeting is it underscores uh, uh, that science is not confined by international borders and is a good reminder for us in these uh, uh, horrific times. So what I like to present today is uh, um, 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 stories of or three stories that highlight uh, the importance of NMR in understanding how large dynamic complexes are regulated. And uh, as uh, was mentioned that uh, we use multiple other techniques, but I will highlight here uh, what's, what's really special about NMR. So what's important about, about these complexes or what's common among them is that they have this high level of disorder, as you see in all of them, and that they have multivalent binding. So they, they have, you have the same protein binding at multiple, multiple sites. So a brief introduction, so globular proteins have to fold for them to function. Disordered proteins can fold when they bind or can stay uh, uh, somewhat disordered, and that's called fuzzy complexes. The, the proteins that we have uh, characterized and we coined the term IDP duplexes are uh, uh, proteins that bind to a dimer, shown here in, in green, that has a symmetrical binding groove where there is uh, folding at the site of binding, but the rest of the protein uh, remains disordered. And this is where NMR comes in, comparing the free and bound, we can identify the sites of binding and identify changes that accompany binding. And at the time, at the time this was published, there were very few examples of proteins that do not fold when, when they bind, but, but they retain that there is disorder. So, so IDP duplex scaffolds, what, what we call this, is one example of multivalent assemblies. And, 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 and uh, shown, shown in this cartoon here, we have disordered, disordered chains, binding a dimer, that dimerization uh, brings together or promotes self-association or could promote binding at this, at this, at this, at this closed site. And we've, uh, for many of these, uh, we have several examples that we've characterized the, the enhancement in affinity uh, for example, here, when you have a bivalent uh, two chains, the binding is 50-fold tighter than when you have a monovalent chain. Without a change in structure, just the enhancement is being, is being paid off from entropy. And similarly here, we have binding at one site, promotes self-association at a site that's distant by about 100 amino acids. And uh, here, uh, dimerization promotes um, coil, coil formation. The protein likes to be the a primarily monomeric, but upon binding to this dimer, it 
it uh, promotes its self-association. So that's different from what's known now, more known in the IDP community as phase separation or uh, droplet formation, which are non-specific interactions. What I'm talking about is formation of IDP duplex scaffolds. So we asked the questions of how prevalent are these IDP duplexes in biology? And I, I will focus on some stories that show us they're prevalent and also what they do in terms of function. And to remind you that the challenge here is that there's extensive uh, conformation and composition heterogeneity in these multivalent assemblies. So uh, the player here is a protein called LC8. It's a small dimeric protein that is originally identified as a subunit of dynein. Dynein is a megadalton complex, and it binds its partners or in as as a beta strand here. So they have disorder. They come in, they, they bind, and they become a beta strand. It has symmetrical binding groups. It's a highly conserved. It's ubiquitous, found in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, and the mitotic and mitotic cells, etc. So it's a very important protein. And what we found is that its role, uh, or it, it binds multiple other proteins, more than 100, and these proteins are that highly diverse in function. Um, as you see here, all the structures look the same, all the partners will bind in this, in this symmetrical binding groove. And uh, we've, in my lab, we've characterized all those in circles, and the ones in green are where they bind multivalently. So there is a specific uh, motif that recognizes LC8 as and sort of characterized by a TQT, but a very variable, uh, variable uh, boundaries. And the, the importance is that that stretch of protein is disordered, and and binds in a highly in the highly conserved region of the at the dimer interface. And so it does, it does promote code, code formation. This is a real example, self-association and multivalent sites. In some cases, in some cases we have five, five proteins in a row. So then they are prevalent in biology. And uh, then since there are more than 100 proteins that bind LC8, a lot of, a lot of these proteins have multiple sites for LC8. For example, there's this protein called ASCIS that has this, this long disordered tail and has 11 sites for binding LC8. So that's the story I'm going to tell you about with my first story. So ASCIS uh, cell biology is well characterized, uh, knockouts, are, uh, fat mass development, in fact, Drosophila development, and these uh, knockouts are rescued by addition of LC8. And so this is how LC8 was, uh, or ASCIS was discovered as a transcription factor for LC8. So, LC8, so ASCIS is a transcription factor. It has a DNA binding domain. It has a long disordered transcription activation domain. And in this disordered domain, there are 11 sites for LC8. Uh, this is work by former grad student Sarah Clark. So it is possible then to have 11 uh, LC8 dimers binding, binding to this place. So we wanted to know what is the purpose of that and how does that happen? And so if, uh, so if LC8 uh, uh, or if ASCIS is transcription factor of LC8, it binds the LC8 promoter and produces LC8. And when there is a lot of LCA, the, the by feedback loop, LCA comes back and binds in this transactivation domain and stops transcription. So then this protein acts as a sensor for, for the concentration of the LC, of LCA and cells. High LCA stop transcription, low LCA produce, produce uh, starts transcription and produce LCA. And multiple LCAs are, are found in, uh, in ASCIS uh, proteins across species, so that is, it's, it's important to have more than one. So, it's, uh, so the question is why we have so many. So we started by looking at, at the peptides and we measured, measured binding of these peptides. All these peptides, it bind, some of them bind much, uh, with much lower affinity. So they are weak binders, but when you put all of them together, they bind nicely cooperatively. And then we have now a, a, a complex that can have up to seven, uh, up to seven LC8 sites with, between two chains of, of, uh, of, uh, the, of disordered protein. Now, if you stop here, we, we would think this is, this is uh, correct based on the stoichiometry we get from ITC. But we move on to do other techniques, which is analytical ultracentrifugation that can look at the shape and, and uh, of the peaks that come out and the size. And uh, what we see is that excess LC8, we never really form a fully bound complex. What we form is a, is a multiple complexes or a dynamic, dynamic ensemble of, 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 of equilibrium. 
and uh, this is ver verified or quantified or uh, uh, by a negative stain electron microscopy. So if you look, if you take this complex and visualize it by negative stain electron microscopy, you see multiple different uh, compositions. So as, as I'm highlighting here, for example, each, each of these beads, white beads is an LCA dimer. So we have here uh, three, we have four, we have five, etc. And, and we developed uh, recently a, a, an algorithm that can pick these out in a such a heterogeneous uh, complex and you get, you get a, com a, 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 compil a compilation of all of these uh, uh, possible potential com uh, complexes that differ in compositions. You can have two all the way to seven if you have, if you have up to seven and, and it has multiple also conformations. So there is both configuration or composition and, and conformation the heterogeneity. So what's uh, uh, so how do we? So the question becomes then: You have all these LCA sites. How are we going to know which forms a, a a bead on a string kind of rod and which would form a dynamic assembly like like what this one does? And with seven or eleven, it's very highly complex. We wanted to, to look at smaller, smaller constructs, which are still complex, but will allow us to do uh, to do more thorough NMR. So uh, here we have just three, and we chose this construct. It's part of the of the longer domain to ask the question about the length of the linker separating the sites. So here we have a short linker separating the first and second, and a long linker separating the third. And by ITC, it looks a simple binding. It can fit a simple binding model with three sides. But when you look at NMR titration and follow peak intensity drop, they all drop similarly. So we really don't learn anything. And at the, at the end of the titration, you lose all the peaks. But we were able to uh, make this in, in, in a deuterated, deuterated complex. And at raising, with raising the temperature, we were able to actually assign the bound form. So you have peaks disappear, but some, but we can see the peaks that reappear when you have deuterium uh, in deuterated complex. And those, those actually do form beta strands. So this is the structure of the bound. And we have three beta strands at each side of the, of the motif. And, and just to remind you, one LC8 dimer binds one, one motif, two chains of the motif and form a beta strand. So here you have three, three in a row. So to ask the question about uh, is there any difference, I mean, what saturates first? And so we use saturation transfer difference experiments and at substoichiometric uh, concentration of LC8, we identify that one motif, the QT2, so these amino these residues correspond to this to this motif here, which is the first uh, the first motif. These are the ones that appear first in the saturation transfer difference experiment, implying that this is where binding starts. And this is not surprising because QT two peptide is the tightest binding, so the tightest binder starts first. And then when looking at heterogeneous, you see that this is a quite is quite ordered. The linker is disordered, and the, and this is and and the QT four is ordered. But then when we look at the relaxation measurements, you just uh, uh, R2 over R1, you see that QT and Q, uh, uh, QT2 and 3 behave as a unit. Then when they are separated by this disordered linker, it be, there, is, it, it is, there is distinct, distinct dynamics. So what we learn from this is that the two sites here that are next to each other behave as a unit, even if this QT3 is the weakest binder. So this is as a peptide, it has a very weak binding, but because of its proximity to a, because of, a, you know, the linker length, these two Bind, bind as a unit. So then the length of the linker trumps motif specificity, while the length here in long linker is, uh, gives much more, much, much more flexibility for, 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 uh, for the third site. So, so what, what we learn, so what we're trying to get from looking at these different constructs is where in this sequence we can predict that we have, that is the reason where we have multiple dynamic, dynamic complexes rather, uh, and that, that are partially occupied rather than, than fully occupied. So with su summarizing the data, the data into a model, so what, uh, what, this, what we call here the, sen the sensor hypothesis is that at high LC8 occupancy, when all of these are populated, which is a, when all of these are occupied, which is actually a low populated complex, 
this shuts down transcription. When we don't have LC8, we start transcription. But the majority of the of the of the protein is actually in this in this dynamic equilibrium, where it's partially occupied, and that's because it's when it needs to be responsive to the concentration in the cells. So the LC8 is low, we increase transcription. LC8 is high, we drop transcription, and it's all it's all by by acting as a buffer in this in between uh, to give this tuning effect rather than on and off switch. So that's why we have multiple sites instead of a, of a single site. So that's the story with ASCIS. Now, in a, a different story that involves also an IDP, IDP duplex, but in this case, we have only one site for LC8 binding. And that's if that's the protein from the rabies virus. And that's work done by also former grad students, Nathan Jesperson. It's important to, to remind you here that so LC8 is a, is a protein that we call hub because it binds a lot of other proteins. It also binds a lot of viruses. So viruses can latch to LC8 from the host. And, uh, and in the case of rabies, we know some, some, some physiological relevance to that binding um, um, where um, uh, this is uh, this is just a cartoon of, 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 of the rabies virus. You have a, a polymerase, so it's made of uh, five proteins, the polymerase, the nucleoprotein, but then the polymerase and the nucleoprotein are connected by a, uh, a uh, protein called phosphoprotein, so that connects these to, to put them in the right orientation, where uh, uh, at one end it binds the polymerase, at another end it binds it binds the nucleoprotein. So this is the domain structure of the phosphoprotein. It has a high level of, of disorder. The structure of the dimerization domain is solved. The structure of the C-terminal domain is solved. It's also solved, but there's no no data to our work to on the full length on the full length protein. Important to us is that full length protein has this site for LC8 binding. So LC8 binds disordered regions. It's a small linker here where LC8 binds. And there is studies out there that show that LC8 binding actually does affect um, lethality. So, it, uh, so viruses that have the phosphoprotein that remove the TQT, which is the motif for recognition motif for LC8, these, these, these animals live while the animals that don't that bind LC8, they die. So, so it's a huge phenotype, but what can we say about that? And I'm just going to tell you, we don't have an answer, but it's just, we have, we have some data that supports some ideas. And that's what I will show you. So we can look at the NMR spectrum here. This is 66 kilodalton dimer. We can do assignments by looking at multiple domains. We never see the peaks corresponding to the, to the dimerization domain. These, are, these remain this gone. We see peaks for everything else. And then we characterize binding by other techniques. And then the question becomes, now we have a structure of the, uh, or a model of the, of the free protein before binding LC8. We have c domain, we have a dimerization domain that's based on the crystal structure and a lot of disorder. What does LC8 do to the structure? And so we can, we collect spectra for LC8 bound to, to the, to the rabies protein, rabies virus protein. And there is that just at first glance, you don't see much difference. Maybe a few residues, a few peaks that disappear. We do a lot of different dynamics trying to see, is there anything that jumps at you that tells you there's a major change between, uh, between bound and free. There are, this is where binding takes place. So you see, you see changes between black and red. You see some changes here also between black and red and that are in the, in the linker region. The most dramatic change we see is when we do paramagnetic relaxation experiments where we saturate in the C-terminal domain, all the peaks in the C-terminal domain disappear. And also the, the peaks that are in the quite a bit far in the sequence also dec decrease uh, decrease some to so tell us that there is some changes that happen that are more domain domain interact uh, interaction changes rather than than local changes. So with that, looking at uh, SACS data and, and doing and doing molecular dynamic simulation, we come up with with profiles of pot potential potential structures. The, or an ensemble of structures for the protein without LC8. So you over, so this is kind of the distribution uh, and, and this is the kind of structure that you get when you overlay them all on top of each other. It's probably overlaying 10, five. 
And then when you add LC8, you get a distribution that's quite different. If you compare the red to the to the to the black, there is there are some some some, uh, some structures that are not uh, populated. And then if you overlay them on top of each other, what we see is there is a distinct separation between the folded domain and the disordered domain. So and the LC8 here is shown in red. So the subtle effect of LC8 here is in restricting the linkers. So if you look at the domain architecture here and compare it to a protein that doesn't have LC8 but has a longer dimerization domain. What LC8 did here is just extended the dimerization domain so it restricted the mobility of these of the folded domains relative to the to the disordered to the disordered domain. And that's enough to based on our model to actually affect polymerase activity and replication, because now with LC8 in here, you're studying that, that tetamyl domain on the, on the nuclear protein so that replication can happen more efficiently. So that's, that's one model that we're proposing. So to summarize these two stories is we have an example where we where we have a duplex with, with multiple places for LC8 to bind that results in a dynamic equilibrium of complexes. And uh, in an example, we have only one LC8 to bind that it can result in differentiation between an active form. This is the form that kills the mice, and this is the form that doesn't. So, we, we, uh, so when, what multivalency does, or the multiple LC8 does, uh, it creates a gradient of affinities and acts as a concentration sensor while within one side we have more dynamic restriction and it can also tune the dimerization strength that's another model i didn't talk about and so and highlight that we have two kinds of heterogeneity here uh, composition and heterogeneity and confirmation heterogeneity so composition is just this added complexity that instead of having seven bond we have two three four five six seven to give to give better better chances for proteins to do more things so with the few minutes I have left, I want to tell you one more story that we haven't published, and that's a, that is um, uh, another another LC8 duplex, but it's a, a part of the dining uh, from the dining structure. So this is a cartoon showing dining on microtubules. It's dining in gray that binds another complex called dinactin. This thing here in, in light gray is what you cannot see by electron microscopy. So we know structures of dining, but what's missing is the, is the disordered region, which I will tell you about. And also this, this protein binds another complex called nudi. So this intermediate chain I'm showing here in this in this in this domain architecture, the, the internal domain of it is fully disordered. We've we've established that how many years ago now? It was a, one of the very few uh, uh, first examples of protein this large, about 300 amino acids, that is that is disordered, and we worked on pieces of it doing NMR and thermodynamics to show that binding at one site promotes self-association at a distant site and that binding at another site, I showed you these figures before, pr 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 promotes multivalent binding. We, but we were never able to look at the full length domain. This was 300 amino acids to do NMR on. Till Kayla Jara, a student in my lab, was, was very, uh, uh, has an amazing hands, was and using a, a, uh, a, 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 a protein from the ketomium thermophilum um, organism that behaved better. So now we had, we were able to do NMR on this 260 amino acids. That is, that's a mixture of folded and, uh, and, and disordered. And with the help of, of Nico, uh, who was doing sabbatical in my lab, Nico Loning, he, uh, was, we were able to assign this, uh, this messy peak here, but the peaks that were assigned were only corresponding to the disordered region. The peaks that corresponds to the predicted folded regions uh, we're, we're missing. We were able to look at, to see some of those peaks when we raise the temperature to 40 degrees. So now that when you raise the temperature to 40 degrees, the spectrum becomes so much better. You get much better dispersion. So a lot of these peaks here are starting to appear, but you couldn't assign them because uh, they, they're quite broad. So we couldn't really uh, have them assigned, but we could use them as, 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 uh, as probes to look at what binds in these areas, even though we don't have, we don't have them assigned. Now, this is the region here, this part of the, of the sequence where it binds these other complexes, P150 and UD, it doesn't matter what they are, but it binds two other things. And so we, we just make a con construct that corresponds to this region here. 
and we see beautiful binding, very tight binding by ITC, kind of funny behavior, but we don't, we won't have to discuss it now. And we see binding here. If we make it a little longer, where it includes the, the, the sites where the light chains bind, it still binds fine. It just doesn't really change very much. Now, when we make the full domain, uh, the binding is either totally gone or some, you know, so totally different behavior by ITC. So here we have just one, just a com completely different behavior of when, when you have the full length protein. Con remembering here my, uh, that only this part binds, the very first bit of it is the binding site of these two. You make the protein longer, you start changing how, how it binds. And so this uh, underscores that context matters. It also tells us that what possibly is happening is when you have this long piece, it's actually folding on itself and covering the bind the, where the binding is. And that's what we would call autoinhibition state. So now the state here doesn't, doesn't bind. So we wanted to uh, confirm if that's the case. So this is where we come back to NMR. And we here, because we have the, we can we use the high temperature to see the, 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 the more peaks, the more dispersed peaks that corresponds to the folded regions that were missing in the assignments at 10 degrees. What, what, we, what I'm showing here in, in, uh, in two different colors is, uh, is one light chain binding and another light chain, light chain binding, and here different one at a time. So we have here these binary complexes that are overlaid and shifted a little so that you see the different colors. So what, uh, what you see is that two distinct behaviors. So pointed to by arrows here are the peaks that are different in, 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 in this and on, on, the, on the right. So on the right where we have arrows, peaks are gone because peaks are gone when you add P150 and MG and when you add the last light chain, the yellow light chain. While here, here these peaks, when you add the, 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 the chains in the middle, they are, they are still there. So the way we explain this is these proteins, the light chains that bind in the middle, they bind. I mean, we have evidence of binding because different peaks are disappearing but they don't relieve it auto-inhibition, it still stays auto-inhibited. But you actually want the last light chain, which binds here, to relieve the auto-inhibition. So you have this, you need the multivalent site, the third one, so that it, uh, because when we bind one here and, and bind the P150 and MG on the other end, one at a time, they show a different similar behavior indicating that when binding happens, it's opening up, it's opening up the chain. So to test that, we uh, uh, actually make pieces of this protein, uh, two different pieces, and, and titrate them into each other. And so if we look at the black, which is corresponding to, to, to this, this part of the construct and titrate it with the other end, other end of the protein, we see peaks disappear, corresponding to where exactly P150 and MG bind. So then this protein has developed a way to, to cover itself so that it's protected till it's ready to bind, to bind its partner. And when you have the three light chains, so when you have only two, it's still, it's the, it's still, it's still protected, it's still auto-inhibited, you have to bind the three, and that's when they have the three, then you relieve autoinhibition. And this part here becomes open, open for binding as we show by NMR, which I'm showing, and as we show by, by gel filtration. And you, you see by, by STS page that you have these five, five bands of proteins present in, in, these, in these complexes. So with this, I'm going to summarize what, what I told you today is that uh, the, this new new class of IDP, what we call IDP duplexes, we, call, we consider it an emerging class of IDP multivalent complexes. They common among them is they bind LC8 help protein. They are prevalent, more than 100 partners, and also in viruses. And they display compositional and conformation heterogeneity. And what we showed with ASCIS is that they function as concentration sensors so that they can tune the, the level of LC8 in cells rather than having on and off switch. And they also are the structural framework of many mechanized complexes. I showed you data on dynein, but we have, we have also data on the nuclear pore and, and the mitotic spindle. And they're associated with many cancer 
uh, and viral infection. So to, to leave you with these, with this view, we have equilibrium dynamic of complexes that's what multivalency gives us. It gives us restriction of, of confirmations or extending the dimerization domain. So now linkers are not free to rotate and that's good enough for function. And it also causes auto, relieves auto inhibition so that the protein can bind when it's required, when it's needed to bind. And with this, I'm going to thank uh, the people who did the work. I've mentioned several of them as I went along. The work on dining is done by, Ke by, uh, by Kayla Jara and, and Nico Loning. Uh, Aidan did uh, the development of the algorithm for, um, for prediction of LC8 sites. And I've mentioned Nathan and Sarah, former grad students and work funded by NSF and NIH and several collaborators. And uh, I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Elisar, for this very interesting uh, talk. There are already a couple of questions, I believe, from the, uh, from the Q&A. So David Elizer says, hi, Elisar. Is there anything, a loss tree, that compels the LC8, the LC8 uh, to bind the equivalent site on each of the two partners? Or could you bind two different sites at one LC8, creating even more diversity? Yes, that's good. That's a question that we struggled with for many years, and I think we have, we have an answer for now. So it's, uh, uh, if, if the linkers are, if the linker length is short, so you have, you have cooperativity or higher cooperativity, you're going to bind two and two. You're not going to have off register. But then in the case where the linker is, is long, you know, you start to add more complexity where, where uh, you can have only one, one uh, 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 binding on one chain and bridging to another chain. So it is possible that you would have two different chains of you know, two, two, two different diameters. You don't have to just have two and two and two and two. All along, I thought we need to have always two and two and two and two. And that's because I was looking at, at partners at, that, on, that have short linkers. But once we started making the, long, the linker longer, the complexity in, increased. And yes. uh, related to David? Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, no, just related to this question. My question was, when you had these, uh, like the, the the two dimer units bound to the three LC8 units, uh, where two of them were, I think it was uh, Q2 and Q3, and then Q4 was on the other, on the other side. And then you say that Q3 actually uh, was weaker binder, uh, yet the, the entire thing was uh, more stable. So that means you're suggesting there that actually the K on is actually for Q3 is actually uh, increased. Is, is, that, is that what you're suggesting? Uh, perhaps I didn't understand that properly. Okay, so uh, so when we look at uh, um, you're asking about about yeah, the, 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 the first the first example, yeah, exactly this one. So so QT three is a very weak binder on its own. Uh, but it does it in the in the presence of the complex in the, uh, the, 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 the the yeah in the presence of the complex these two. Uh, behave as a unit. So, uh, but then it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of K-on. It's because K2 binds first and then it actually embeds binding of K, uh, Q2-3. Yep. Yep. Is, is, that, is that what you're suggesting? Yes. So oh. this has to bind first. And not only because it's tighter binding, what we're seeing now, because we're looking at combi at smaller even, just two, just really to try to understand it. It's just, it, it, it's tighter binder and it also at the edge. So the edge is going to fill first. So here it's going to bind before this one. And, and just because these two are close, these will bind first and then followed by this. Or maybe this happens at the same, at the same time as this. But in terms of dynamics, these are more the rigid rod, not this, even though this binding is tight. I, I understand that was my, my feeling. Thank you. Yeah, but what I did not show actually, which would have, would have answered uh, uh, David's, David's uh, uh, question is we did uh, a native mass spectrometry on this complex so we know exactly what kind of complexes we have and we don't have what I'm showing you here this is we, we have this in addition to other things so we, we even have uh, some that have four so that 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 says you know you, they have to be off register somehow to, to be able to have four 
mm-hmm. or, or or even or less. So it's a so this is gives you it is a very simplified version that they are all there, but actually it's much more than just that. And why is that na- important for nature? Is, is because it you know in some cases you want just ladder like structure, in other cases you would want them to to bridge other complexes. So it's good to have one free on its own to do that. Okay, so there is another question uh, from uh, Supriya Pratihar. Uh, says, did you feed the decreasing intensities from NMR titrations to get KD and how it compares to the KD from ITC? I'm not sure to which specific example, I guess it's a general question. Yeah, uh, no, so it's looking at, which I'm not showing here, uh, uh, looking at these peak intensities mm-hmm. and say, we, and we did, and we did that for multiple other constructs. And uh, numbers you get uh, are, then, are, do not, do, are not the same as ITC. Um, and there are many things that, that contribute to that. But, but uh, uh, what was important for us from fitting that, uh, uh, that data is to show that actually when you fit QT2 and QT3, uh, they're coming out the same number. But if you look at QT3 alone by ITC, it's coming out much weaker. Okay. You see, so, so ITC is looking at the whole system and, or at looking at peptides alone. But we are in, in, when we're looking at NMR, we're looking at the whole system and, and we're looking at what's cooperative. So QT2 and QT3, even though one alone doesn't fit the same as ITC, they come out by NMR to be the same. Mm-hmm. I think Sorry, could you say what is much weaker, a factor of 10 or 100? Or what, what, how do they compare? Oh, um, QT3 doesn't, you know, you can't even, you know, I would say a factor of, of 10. Okay. Or maybe five, depends on if it's, yeah. Because when it's too tight, too weak, it's just hard to get the accurate number. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, and then there is uh, Francesca Marassi says, beautiful work, Elisar, which I agree. And uh, I think that Marcus uh, was... Uh, Want to if, I, well. if I may, I would like to take the opportunity also to ask a question. Uh, so yes. I was just wondering, I mean, you, you kind of put a disclaimer in the beginning saying this is not phase separation, and uh, but something else. But I mean, if one looks at the system, of course, with the multivalency and also David's question, whether you can have not only sort of parallel, but also other kinds of bindings. I mean, of course, one wonders, yes. is there not a contribution to phase separation also? I mean, the systems which you're looking at is transcription where phase separation is hotly discussed or debated. It's nuclear pore, the phase separation might play a role. So I'm, I'm a little bit wondering yes. if you don't have phase separation. <laughs> no, I, uh, so uh, this is what we see by electron microscopy, by negative stain. Hmm. Okay, so we are seeing nice, uh, at least for some, we're seeing a nice ladder, ladder shape, beads on a string, kind of that's dynamic, but you but you don't see a mass, you see it, 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 a ladder like. But we we've you know in the beginning again I'm changing I'm changing how I view this. In the beginning I always said this is not phase separation. I insist. Um, but I would I I would say because we are seeing so many examples that are actually different. Like in the, in, in the beginning, my model was um, like, it's going to be, uh, uh, which one would be a good model? Like, what are these proteins doing in cells? This, this is, this is my model, okay? But, and it is true for a lot of them, but, and that, but where binding is so weak, which is a, 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 a property of phase separation, so it's, that's non-specific, you can hardly see it. It is possible to have to have a uh, a system where uh, it is being used for you know it does phase separation. Mm-hmm. So, but so, but I would say it's 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 system dependent, it's protein dependent, and in these ones that I looked at here, the one I'm showing on the screen, it's not phase separation. We know the structures, and uh, but in 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 uh, other examples where which we are still studying, where we know the protein, but physiologically actually does phase separate is, is L3 it could be maybe competing with phase separation by forcing these into a into a nice ladder-like structure mm. or it could be also bridging 
specifically, and bridging specifically is not phase separation, or if the interactions are so weak, it could become also a way to concentrate proteins so that they phase separate. Mm -hmm. So I would not want to re restrict it to one to one possibility. I think it could do it could be it could be more than just one possibility. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah.